Okay. So I did want to say thank you to everybody for um, watching the Ivan Raken, Raiklin, um interview. It was the all-time best show of any Rumble that we've ever done. Um, that was truly amazing. Um, and I just really, really appreciate all of the support um, from everyone. And Stellar, I tried to give you the uh, mic. Let me see if I can invite you to co-host. I don't know what's going on. Um, and I think the interview was, number one, completely different than any he's done. And as a result of that, um, I'm tickled with the way it turned out. Number two, I do think, and I had a phone call from someone I really respect immediately after the interview that said, so my purpose in doing the interview, um, because obviously we don't have a big audience, but it dovetails into what we talk about every day. But I wanted to look at him and what he's doing in relation to Operation Gladio. Um, because it, like I said, it dovetails neatly into what we're doing in the exposure, because that's what he's doing. He's trying to expose the truth. So as a result of that, um, uh, both Bridget and Cousin It did a great job in finding me a lot of background material on him. And I wanted to start off the conversation with that information. And I think because obviously no one else has done the, um, the due diligence of looking at actually who he is, um, where he came from, what, what's a priority to him. Um, and I do think that changed the entire tone of the interview. Um, <laughs> because one of the first things he said is like, who are you again? And of course, the um, the interesting aspect of that is the person that called me was like, how could he get on someone's podcast and not even know who they are? Why didn't he do that research? Um, and while I think that's a very valid original or initial take, what I will say is that generally speaking, anyone that reaches out to him to have him on their podcast is going to want to um, promote what he's saying because otherwise they wouldn't give him the time of day. And on the other hand, being a special forces guy, they're kind of, you know, poke you in the chest. And so um, if they were to just so happen to have someone contact them that's a hostile force, I'm sure he would absolutely relish the opportunity as he has in so many cases with these reporters trying to get in his face and do that. He would absolutely love it. So if you don't have to, you know your material so well and you have no fear of putting people in their place, why would you waste your time? Um, I mean, obviously it's flattering if somebody does do that, but I, I, that's what I said. I, 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 his time is more precious than that and he can handle himself either way. So good on him. No, I was genuinely interested in his take. Um, right. And I do, um, I did tell him offline that I I do want to have him back. Um, and, you know, when I made the comment about the um, general officers, he's like, send me that list. Um, so. And you can see how both of you were looking 
looking through similar lenses. Maybe not the same ones, but very similar lenses. Oh, yeah. Seeing the same thing, you know. Absolutely. All right. So I know everybody is psyched that um, Trump is back on X. Um, <laughs> right. And um, that. Uh, oh, there's still Stellar um, came up. OK. Yeah. I know it's just really glitchy. Um, I don't know what's going on. So keep a lookout for um, Cousin It. Um, anyway, we're going to go ahead um, and, oh, let me say this so I don't forget at the end. We are not going to have the regular eight o'clock um, for the pond um, episode uh, this week um, because obviously um, of Elon Trump uh, X space, but uh, Trump frog is going to afterwards open the pond so that we can have a discussion of what just happened. Um, and um, he definitely wants to address the um, Hodge twins uh, uh, comments about um, Q. And I love the way uh, Ivan kept saying the letter after P, the letter after P. And when I was watching a couple of his interviews doing my homework before um I got on air with him. I've heard him say that a couple of times. And I'm like, the letter after P, why doesn't he just say Q? Um, but I've also been told that that gets you um, bounced off of uh, YouTube, um, depending on who says it. So I, I do understand why he said it that way. But I just I wanted to make clear that to everyone that that's basically um, kind of the way he referred to it as, and I just had to laugh. Um, it's the letter after P. Okay, so I'm going to spend probably at a minimum three days on Korea. I'm going to start off with William Bloom, uh, Killing Hope book, um, chapter five, which talks about Korea from 1945 to 1953. And um, then we're going to go to several other source documents for the day two and three. And the reason why I want to do this is a couple of reasons, because I want you to understand um the different aspects of what happened in Korea and why it matters now. And Korea was pivotal to the post-World War II um, building up of Operation Gladio. And you, you have to realize that we had not even brought anyone home from World War II before we were in Korea. And you have to ask yourself why that is. Now, we're going to um, discuss this over the course of these next several days. Um, it is quite obvious that as they're getting the coalition together to set up NATO. And as they're getting the apparatuses to, um, together for the UN, the IMF, the World Bank, and all of these global um, international uh, syndicate apparatuses, they could not allow the world to demobilize. They couldn't. So there had to be some skirmish, some war, some false flag. There had to be some reason to keep all of the wheels of global warfare turning. And I want you guys to understand that because if you don't understand that core principle, you're not going to understand why Korea is important. Korea became a bridge for the military industrial complex to transition into Operation Gladio. It is pivotal to everything that we talk about. Um, and I, I wanna 
explain a little bit about their history and I'll go into more of that probably tomorrow, but it's also important to know that Japan had colonized Korea um, for a very long time. They had, they used Korea as a slave colony. They exported Koreans under false pretenses. Um, and I just did a post on that um, a few days ago to all of the areas that Japan was conquering throughout the Pacific region. And so it was a, it was the, what Africa is to Europe, Korea was to Japan. And that's also critical to understand. So they were treated not as equals, but as a caste society subservient population. And when Japan was occupying Korea, they set up a very similar um, cultural entity or structure that it's it's kind of similar to the um, the dynasties that we have in the United States that pretend to be our royalty, if you will, the Roosevelts, the Delanos, the um, Rockefellers, the Carnegies, all of those storied families and their monopoly power over different industries is very much the way Japan is set up. And they actually even have a particular name for, and I'm not going to look it up right now. Um, I wouldn't know how to pronounce it anyway. Um, but there's actually a name. That's how um, uh, well recognized this phenomenon is in Japan. Well, they basically instituted this same type of corruption um, oligarch structure in Korea in order for them to be able to use an elite um, uh, amount of people. And, and, and it's very similar to what we've talked about in all of the different um, countries where they um, set up this elite force that does their bidding while they're not there. Um, kind of like the um, overseer of a plantation. And it was done based on corporate structure. So in Japan, the family owned Mitsubishi, to Toyota, um, all of those different um, Japanese corporate giants are ran like a little mafia. And that same type of structure um, got passed down to, if, if that's probably not the most accurate way of saying it, but that got adopted in post-World War II Korea after the U.S. Um, did their thing there. So we're going to get started. Um, and again, this is from the book, uh, William Bloom, Killing Hope, um, Korea, 1945 to uh, 1953. And it says, um, how is it that the Korean War escaped the protests which surrounded the war in Vietnam? Everything we've come to love and cherish about Vietnam had its forerunner in Korea. The support of the corrupt tyranny, the atrocities, the napalm, the mass slaughter of civilians, the cities, the villages laid to waste, the calculated management of the news, the sabotage of peace talks. But the American people were convinced that the war in Korea was an unambiguous case of one country invading another without provocation, a case of the bad guys attacking the good guys who were being saved by the even better guys. None of the historical, political, or moral uncertainty that was the dilemma in Vietnam. The Korean War was seen to have begun in a specific manner, i.e. North Korea attacked South Korea in the early morning of 25 June 1950. While Vietnam, no one seemed to know how it all began or when or why. 
and there was little in the way of accusations about American imperialism in Korea. The U.S., after all, was fighting as part of a U.N. army. What was there to protest about? And of course, there was McCarthyism, so prevalent in the 1950s, which further served to inhibit protest because you didn't want to be seen as a communist sympathizer. There were, in fact, rather different interpretations to be made of what the war was all about, how, how it was being conducted, even how it began. But these quickly succumbed to <laughs> the trash bin of history. Shortly after the close of World War II, the Soviet Union and the United States occupied Korea in order to expel the defeated J Japanese. A deep marcation line between the area that Russia was going to, and keep in mind, Russia and the U.S. are allies. They're in it together. Um, so they had agreed that the Soviet Union was going to take a particular area and the U.S. was going to take another area, just like we did in Germany, just like we did in France. There were, um, and that's what we did in Northern Iraq. There were five different countries represented up there um, and the U.S. was the overall lead command. That is a normal way of doing this. Okay. Um, and the goal was to get the deep seated Japanese out of Korea that had been there for decades. A demarcation line between Russia and American forces was set up along the 38th parallel. And that wasn't a like a, a, a hostile zone. Again, we were allies at the time. The creation of this line in no way had anything to do with establishing two separate countries. It just had to do with um, combatant command authority and who was going to be police what area in order to expel the common enemy of the Japanese. Both powers insisted that the unification of North and South was the principal desired goal. However, they also desired to see this carried out in their own way. Although both Moscow and Washington and their hand-picked Korean leaders were not always displeased about the division of the country on the grounds that half of a country was better than none. Officials and citizens on both sides continued to genuinely call for unification on a regular basis. So what happens is um, like in the aftermath of World War II, in these areas, which we did with the Kurds in Northern Iraq, you basically appoint a local governor and we'll just use that term. That's not what they call them, but um, it's unique in every area. So that there is a civilian chain of command in these occupied areas, which are supposed to be temporarily occupied. And that is just to get the country up and running from having kicked out the invaders. And so you will go in and you will find someone that is among you know, maybe the previous ruling elite or a royal family or something like that that had been kicked out of the country will come back. And that's who we talk to and work through in our respective areas. Now, generally what happens is in like what we were doing in Germany is those people coordinate among themselves to establish a central government. But no one in the U.S. actually wanted that to happen. The Korea, that Korea was still one country with unification still the goal at the time of the war began, was underscored by the chief U.S. delegate in the U.N., Warren Austin, in a statement that he made. Here's the quote. The artificial barrier, which is divided, that ha has divided North and South Korea, has no basis for existence either in law or reason, neither the United Nations, its commission on Korea, nor the Republic of Korea, which meant the South part, recognizes such a line. Now the North Koreans, 
by armed attack upon the Republic of Korea have denied the reality of any such line. Now that's the US's take at the UN. The two sides had been clashing along the parallel for several years. What happened on that fateful day in June could thus be regarded as no more than an escalation of an ongoing civil war. The North Korean government had claimed that in 1949 alone, the South Korean army or police perpetrated 2,617 armed incursions into the North to carry out murder, kidnapping, pillage, and arson for the purpose of causing social disorder and unrest, as well as to increase the combat capability of themselves. At times, stated the Pyongyang government, thousands of soldiers were involved in a single battle with many casualties resulting. And I'm gonna stop right here um, because I wanna point out something too. In another article we're gonna go into tomorrow, it talks about the distinct differences between the North and South Korean um, areas. Back in the um, early 1900s, not unlike the early 1900s of America, the North part of Korea was very industrialized and very citified. The South part of Korea was very rural and very agricultural. And there was a distinct difference in the people and their lifestyles. And that was before the Japanese ever showed up. A State Department official, Ambassador at Large, Philip Jessup, speaking in April of 1950, said this, quote, there is constant fighting between the South Korean army and bands that infiltrate the country from the north. There are very real battles involving perhaps one or 2,000 men. When you go to this boundary, as I did, you see troop movements, fortifications, and prisoners of war, <coughs> unquote. Seen in this context, the question of who fired the first shot on June 25th takes on a much um, different air of significance. As it is, the North Korean versions of events is that their invasion was provoked by two days of bombardment by the South on the 23rd and the 24th, followed by a surprise South Korean attack across the border on the 25th in the Western town of Heiju and other places. Announcement of the Southern attack was broadcast all over the North radio later in the morning of the 25th. Contrary to general belief at the time, no UN group, neither the UN military observer group in the field, nor the UN Commission on Korea in Seoul, witnessed or claimed to have witnessed the outbreak of hostilities. The observer group's field trip along the parallel ended on the 23rd of June. So in other words, as soon as the South understood that the UN were going back out of that area, they began launching attacks into the North. Its statements about what took place afterwards are either speculation or based on information received from the people doing the attack, the South Korean government or the US military. Early in the morning of the 26th, the South Korean Office of Public Information announced that Southern forces had indeed captured the North Korea town of Heju. That's spelled H-A-E-J-U. The announcement stated that the attack had occurred the same morning, but an uh, American military status report as of the nightfall of the 25th notes that all Southern territory west of the Himjin River had been lost to a depth of at least three miles inside the border, except in the area of Heiju's counterattack. In either case, such a military victory on the part of the South forces extre is extremely difficult to reconcile with the official Western account maintained to this day that has the North Korean army sweeping into the South in a devastating surprise attack 
taking control of everything that lay before it, forcing the South Koreans to evacuate. Subsequently, the South Korean government denied that its capture of Heju had actually taken place, blaming the original announcement apparently on an exaggerated military officer. Yeah, yeah, we captured it. No, 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 we didn't. One historian says the allegedly incorrect announcement was an error due to poor communication, plus an attempt to stiffen South Koreans' resistance by claiming a victory. Whatever actually lay behind the announcement, it is evident that very little reliance, if any, can be placed upon the statements made by the South Korean government concerning what actually started the war. There were, in fact, reports in the Western press of an attack on Heju, which made no mention of the South Korean government's announcement, and which appeared to be independent confirmations that the event actually happened. The London Daily Herald stated that, quote, American military observers said that the South forces had made a successful relieving counterattack near the West Coast, penetrated five miles into the Northern Territory and seized the town of Heju, unquote. This was echoed in the Guardian of the London, of London, and the same day, quote, American officials confirmed that the Southern troops had captured Heju, unquote. Similarly, the New York Herald Tribune reported also on the 26th that South Kore Korean troops drove across the 38th parallel, which forms the frontier, to capture the manufacturing town of Heju, just north of the line. The Republican forces captured quantities of equipment. None of the accounts ju specified just when the uh, attack took place precisely. On the 25th, American writer John Gunther was in Japan preparing his biography of General MacArthur. As he recounts in the book, he was playing tourist in the town of Nikko with two important members of the American occupation. When one of those was called unexpectedly to the telephone, he came back and whispered, a big story has broken. The South Koreans have attacked North Korea. That's a quote. That evening, Gunther and his party returned to Tokyo, where several officers met us at the station to tell us correctly and with much amplification what had happened. There was no doubt whatsoever that North Korea was the aggressor, except for that's not what was actually on the telephone call. Gunther explains, the message may have been garbled in transmission. Nobody knew anything much at the headquarters the first few hours, and probably people were taken in by the blatant coercive lies of the North. There is something a little um, disingenuous about the picture of American military and diplomatic personnel practicing anti-communists, each one being taken in on so important of a matter. So obviously what's possible is that the phone call said exactly what happened. It just had not went through the diplomatic lies that once they returned to Tokyo, they got the approved story, not the actual story. What they got initially was the actual story. And I'll provide additional over the next couple of days, um, some additional information about that because that is now what most people um, that have done the extensive research into this of who said what and when um, down to like what we just went over, the different news accounts and that type of thing, that that is in fact what happened. The head of South Korea, um, Singman Ri, and his last name is R-H-E-E, -E, had often expressed his desire and readiness to compel the unification of Korea by force. On 26 June, the New York Times reminded its readers that on a number of occasions, Dr. Ri had indicated that his army would have taken the offensive if Washington had given the consent. The newspaper noted also that before the war began, the warlike talk strangely had almost all come from South Korea, not the North. That's a common theme as well. Ri may have had good reason for provoking a full-scale war apart from the issue of unification. 
On 30 May, elections for the National Assembly were held in the South in which Rees' party suffered a heavy loss. Like countless statements before and after him, Rees may have decided to play war card in order to increase the, his support. The labor advisor attached to the American aid mission in South Korea, Stanley Earle, resigned in July, expressing the opinion that South Korean government was an oppressive regime, which did very little to help the people, and that an internal South Korean rebellion against Rees' government would have occurred if the forces of North Korea had not invaded. Now, I want to say a couple of things here. Um, what, what we will go on to realize is like in every one of these um, Gladio stories, the guy that was the primary leader in the North wanted his country back. We see that time and time again, because that's what happened to Ho Chi Minh in Vietnam. They didn't want an occupying force. They didn't want um, the U.S. to be there forever. They didn't want um, handouts. They wanted their country back. And the Dr. Rhee, Sigmund Rhee, was basically someone that between the time of 1945 and 1950, the CIA had basically invaded the south part of Korea, um, which is where most of the leadership of the colony that had been um, orchestrated from Japan. Um, and they figured that there would be more people to buy off down there than the elitists that lived in the industrialized part of the North. So if I, and this is exactly what they did in Cambodia, by the way. Um, if I can go into the South and I can buy off a bunch of people um, and I can get them to pretend like they're their own government, which again is what we did in South Vietnam. And they can then um, attack the guy that's not going to let the U.S. and the West dominate their country, then that's what they're going to do. And you see the patterns or similarities between this, as soon as these countries got emptied out from an occupation force, the vacuum was immediately filled by the intel agencies. And they did this by buying people and then manipulating those people with money, blackmail, whatever. And then th those people basically sell out their countrymen. And you can see this hand working in here as we go through this information. Soviet leader Khrushchev and his um, uh, statements makes it plain that North Korea had contemplated an invasion of the South for some time, and he reports their actual invasion without any mention of provocation. This would seem to put that particular question to rest. However, Khrushchev's chapter on Korea is a wholly superficial account. It is not a serious work of history, nor was it intended to be. As he himself states, my memories of the Korean War are unavoidably sketchy. He did not become Soviet leader until after the war was over. His chapter contains no discussion of any of the previous fighting across the border. Nothing of Rhee's belligerent statements, nothing at all of the Soviet Union's crucial absence from the UN, which, as we shall see, allowed the so-called UN army to be formed and intervened in the conflict. Moreover, his reminiscence as published, are an edited and condensed version of the tapes he made, a study based on comparison between the Russian language transcription of the tape and the published English language book, reveals some of Khrushchev's memories about Korea are indeed sketchy, but that the book fails to bring this out at all. Instead, making it as if it's a verbatim um, recollection. For example, North Korean leader Kim Il-sung met with Stalin to discuss Kim's desire to prod North Korea with the point of a bayonet. The book then states, unambiguously, Kim went home and then returned to Moscow when he had worked everything out. 
In the transcript, however, Khrushchev says, quote, in my opinion, either the date of his return was set or he was to inform us as soon as he finished preparing all of his ideas. Then I don't remember in which month or year Kim Il-sung came and related his plan, unquote. As on 26 June, the United States presented a resolution before the UN Security Council condemning North Korea for its unprovoked aggression. The resolution was approved, although there were arguments that this is a fight between the Koreans and had no business even being put forth between the, in front of the UN Security Council. And it should be basically treated as a civil war. And a suggestion from the Egyptian delegation that the word unprovoked should be dropped in view of the longstanding hostilities between the two. Yugoslavia insisted as well that there seemed to be a lack of precise information that could enable the council to pin responsibility on either side. They proposed North Korea be invited to present its side of the story. This was not done. Three months later, the Soviet foreign minister put forward a motion that the UN hear representatives from both sides. This too was voted down by a margin of 46 to six because North Korea's quote unquote aggression and it was decided to extend an invitation only to the South Koreans, which by the way, was already occupied by the CIA. On the 27th, the Security Council recommended that members from the UN furnish assistance to South Korea as may be necessary to repel the armed attack. President Truman had already ordered the U.S. Navy and Air Force into combat by this time. This is two days later. A tactic, so basically they were presenting to the council what they had already done. A tactic the U.S. was to repeat several times before the war came to an end. The council made its historic decision with the barest of information available and all of it derived selectively from one side. It should be kept in mind that in 1950, the United Nations was in no way a neutral or balanced organization. The great majority of the members were nations very dependent upon the U.S. for economic recovery and development. There was no third world bloc at all. Um, and only four countries of the Soviet bloc were even members at the time none of them on the Security Council. Neither could the UN Secretary General uh, Treviv Lie, L-I-E, of Norway be regarded as neutral in the midst of a Cold War controversy. His memoirs, he makes it remarkably clear that he was no objective outsider. His chapters on the Korean War are pure knee reflex anti-communism and reveal his maneuvering on the issue. In 1949, it was later disclosed Lai had entered into a secret agreement with the U.S. State Department to dismiss from the U.N. employment individuals whom Washington regarded as having questionable political leanings. In other words, the entire staff of the U.N. was selected by the United States State Department and the U.N. Secretary General from Norway was fine with that. The adoption of these resolutions by the Security Council was possibly only because the was made possible only because the Soviet Union was absent from the proceedings due to its boycott of the UN over the refusal to seat China in place of Taiwan. If the Russians had been present, they undoubtedly would have vetoed the resolutions. Their absence was always um has all, always posed an awkward problem for those who insist that the Russians were behind the North Korean invasion. Showing that, yeah. Anyway, I do want to make a point over um, the distinction between China and Taiwan. Now, you will not find it surprising, having followed me for any length of time, you understand exactly why Taiwan was on the, um, in the UN because 
that was a newly created country as well that was set up as a place to put Chiang Kai-shek, the world's largest drug dealer. And the guy, Chiang Kai-shek, that was basically given the island of Taiwan and set up by his U.S. Uh, benefactors like William Polly um, and the CIA to have an air force and a navy to um, ship transit drugs all over the world um, is definitely not going to not vote with the United States. So I'm just going to put that on record. One of the most common explanations offered is that the Russians, as a CIA memorandum stated, wanted, quote, to challenge the U.S. specifically and test the firmness of the U.S. resistance to communist expansion, unquote. Inasmuch as during the existence of the Soviet Union, the same analysis has been put forth by American political pundits for virtually every encounter since the United States um, was involved in World War II, um, it would appear that the test was going on for an extraordinarily long period, and one can only wonder why the Soviets never came to that conclusion. The finishing touch wrote I.F. Stone, quote, was to make the UN forces subject to MacArthur without making MacArthur subject to the UN. This came on July 7th in a resolution introduced jointly by the Brit, the Brits and France. This is commonly supposed to have established the UN command. Actually, it did nothing of the sort. The resolution recommended that all members providing military forces and other assistance, make such forces and other assistance available to a unified command under the United States. It further requested the United States to designate the commander of such forces. This would undoubtedly be MacArthur. It was to be an American show. Military personnel of some 16 other countries took part in one way or the other. But, with the exception of the South Koreans, there could be little doubt what was actually going on. Eisenhower later wrote in his memoirs that when he was considering U.S. military intervention in Vietnam in 1954, also as part of a quote-unquote coalition, he recognized that the of operation would fall on the U.S., but the quote token forces supplied by other nations, as in Korea, would lend real moral standing to a venture that otherwise would make it appear as a brutal example of imperialism, unquote. So you have their dear Eisenhower actually saying that basically all UN um, engagements have token forces supplied by everybody else so that the U.S. can pretend that they have a coalition. And gosh, doesn't that sound so familiar to all of us who have been deployed in coalition forces? Why, yes, it does. The war, and a brutal one indeed, was fought ostensibly in defense of Syngman Rhee's regime. Outside of books published by various South Korean governments, it is rather difficult to find a kind word for the man the U.S. brought back to Korea in 1945 after decades. And where was he? Oh, he was in the U.S. Does that not sound familiar? During the Japanese occupation, he fled to the United States. So he's a homegrown guy that we brought back and, and plopped in South Korea as one of our stooges. He was flown into Korea in one of our planes that MacArthur had. Rhee was soon maneuvered into a position of prominence and authority by who? The U.S. Army. In the process, American officials had to suppress a provincial government called the Korean People's Republic. That was the outgrowth of a number of regional governing committees set up by prominent Koreans and which had already begun to carry out administrative tasks, such as food distributions and keeping order. 
This is very important, guys. The Korean People's Republic, KPR, offer of its services to the arriving Americans was dismissed out of hand. Do you see what's going on? So they had already determined that they are going to perpetuate the war machine and the South Koreans already had their own provisional government, Korean People's Republic. They're not interested in that one because those people were interested in a unified country as well. Despite its uh, name, the KPR included a number of conservatives. Indeed, Re himself had been given the leading position of chairman. Re and the other conservatives, most of whom were still abroad when chosen, perhaps did not welcome the honor because the KPR on balance was probably um, too independent, as it was for the higher echelons of the Army Command, the U.S. Army Command. But after 35 years under Japanese um, colonial power, any group or government set up to undo the effects of colonialism had to have a re revolutionary tinge to it. It was the conservatives in Korea who had collaborated with the Japanese. Leftists and other nationalists who had struggled against them, the makeup of the KPR necessarily reflected this, and it was reportedly more popular than any other political grouping. Therefore, Whenever the political leanings or intentions of the KPR, by denying it any authority, status, or form, the U.S. military was regulating Korean political life as if the country were a defeated enemy and not a friendly state liberated from a common foe, and it had its own right to independence and self-determination. The significance of shunting aside the KPR went beyond this. John Gunther, hardly a radical, summed up the situation this way, quote, so the first and best chance at building a united Korea was tossed away, unquote. And Alfred Crofts, a member of the American military government at the time, has written that, quote, a potential unifying agency became thus one of the 54 splinter groups in South Korea political life, unquote. Seaman Rhee would be Washington's man, eminently pro-American, strongly anti-communist, sufficiently controllable. His regime was one in which landlords, co collaborators, and wealthy and other elements readily found a home. Croft pointed out that, quote, before the American landings, a political right associated with popular thought with colonial rule could not exist. But shortly thereafter, we were to foster at least three conservative factions, unquote. Committed to establishing free enterprise, the U.S. Army sold off vast amounts of confiscated Japanese property, homes, businesses, industrial raw materials, and other valuables. Those who could afford to purchase these assets were collaborators who had grown rich under the Japanese and other profiteers. With half of the wealth of the nation up for grabs, demoralization set in rapidly. While the Russians did a thorough house cleaning of Koreans in the North who had collaborated with the Japanese, the American military embraced the collaborators and at first, even the Japanese themselves to retain positions of administration and authority, much to the consternation of the local Koreans who had fought against their occupation repeatedly. To some extent, these people may have been retained in office because they were most experienced at keeping the country running. Another reason has been suggested to prevent the Korean People's Republic from assuming a measure of power. And it wasn't because there wasn't Koreans there to do the job. It had everything to do with controlling the outcome. And while the North soon implemented widespread and effective land reform and at least formal equality for women, the re-regime repeatedly hostile to these ideas 
Two years later, it enacted a land reform measure, but this applied only to former Japanese property. In 1949, a law to cover other holdings was not enforced at all, and the abuse of land tenants continued both in the new and old forms. Public resentment against the U.S. and the re-administration was aroused because of these policies, as well as because of the suppression of the KPR and some very questionable elections, like really questionable. So reluctant was Re to allow an honest election that by early 1950, he had, been, um, he had become enough of an embarrassment to the U.S. for Washington to threaten to cut off his aid if he failed to do what they wanted and also improve the state of civil liberties, like the appearance of them. Apparently, because of this pressure, elections were held May 30th, um, and the re-government was decisively repudiated. The resentment was manifested in the form of frequent rebellions, including some guerrilla warfare in the hills, from 1946 to the beginning of the war. And even during the war, the rebellions were dismissed by the government as quote-unquote communist-inspired and repressed accordingly. Gunther says, quote, it can be safely said that in the eyes of the Hodge, which is the commander of the U.S. forces in Korea, and Ri, particularly at the beginning, almost any Korean not an, extreme, an extremist was labeled a communist and a traitor, unquote. Patterns. Always the same pattern. General Hodge evidently permitted U.S. troops to take part in the repression. And we've got a lot of evidence to this that we will present in the next couple of days. Mark Gain, a correspondent in Korea for the Chicago Sun, wrote that American soldiers fired on crowds, conducted mass arrests, combed the hills for suspects, and organized posses of Korean uh, resistance. Constable and police for mass raids. Gain related that one of Hodge's political advisors assured him that Re was not a fascist. He was two centuries before fascism, a pure bourbon. Describing the, go the government's anti-guerrilla campaign in 1948, pro-Western political scientist Jean Keijing of Marquette University had written, quote, in these campaigns, the civil liberties of countless persons were often ignored. Frequently hapless villagers suspected of aiding a guerrilla was similarly executed, unquote. Now, guys, this is exactly what we saw in Colombia, Chile, Uruguay, Paraguay, all of South America, all of Latin America. This is the foundation which is why it's so important. A year later, when the Committee of the National Assembly launched an investigation into um, an investigation of the collaborators, Re had his police raid the assembly. 22 people were arrested, of whom 16 were later found to have been basically beat. They had broken ribs, um, fractured skulls, broken eardrums. They had literally been almost beat to death. Um, and this was to investigate why people were dying in these villages. So it tells you who was doing it because Re is the one that launched the attack on the investigators. At the time of the outbreak of the war in June 1950, there were an estimated 14,000 political prisoners, not in North Korea, in South Korea. Even during the height of the war in February 1951, there was a knock ang is spelled K-O-C-H apostrophe A-N-G incident again involving suspicion of aiding guerrillas in which about 600 men and women, young and old, were herded into a narrow village and mowed down by the South Korean army. This is their own people they massacred. 
Throughout the war, a continuous barrage of accusations was leveled by each side at the other, charging the enemy with engaging in all manner of uh, barbarity and atrocities against troops, prisoners of war, and civilians alike in every part of the country. Each side occupied the other's territory at different times, trying to outdo each other in a verbal war. The U.S. thus produced a body of popular myths, not unlike those emerging from other wars, which is widely supported at home. By contrast, during the Vietnam, the inclination of myths to flourish <coughs> was regularly countered by numerous educated protesters who carefully researched the origins of the war, monitored its conduct, and publicized studies sharply at variance with the official versions, eventually influenced the mass media to do the same. It's probably because they learned after the fact of what happened in Korea. There was, for example, the consensus that the brutality of the war in Korea must be laid overwhelmingly on the doorstep of the North. The Koch Ang incident mentioned above may be relevant in providing some counterbalance to this belief. Referring to the incident, the British Korean scholar, Jean Holliday observed this, and I'm gonna quote it. This account not only serves to indicate the level of political violence employed by the UN side, which read that as the US, but also confers inherent plausibility that the DPRK, which is the North Korea, and Southern opponents, accusations of atrocities and mass executions by the UN forces, read US, and re-officials during the occupation of the DPRK in late 1950s. After all, if civilians could be mowed down in the South on suspicion of aiding, not even being guerrillas, just suspicion, what would they do in the North? where millions could reasonably be accused of being guerrillas or political opponents. O's account is but one of a number of reports of slaughter carried out by South Koreans against their own people during the war. Now, I, I want to say this also, that it is possible, and I'm not making this accusation, it is possible that because this has actually happened, um, that when they do these massacres, the narrative at the time is accusing the quote unquote communist of doing it. At this time, North Korea is not communist. Okay. They just got rid of Japan. Japan had the entire country as a unified colony. There's no communist anywhere. It's a North versus South issue. It was not a communist versus capitalism um, issue at all. The New York Times reported a, quote, wave of South Korean government executions in Seoul in December 1950. Renee Cutforth, a correspondent for the BBC in Korea, later wrote, quote, the shooting without trial of civilians designated by the police as quote unquote communist, these ah, executions were done usually at dawn on any patch of waste ground where you could dig a trench and line up the people in front of it. As Gregory Henderson said, a US diplomat who served seven years in Korea in the 40s and 50s, has stated that probably over 100,000 were killed without any trial whatsoever by Ree's forces in the South during the war. Following some of the massacres of civilians in the South, the Ree government turned around and attributed them to the North. Now that's the ambassador saying that. One way in which the United States contributed directly to the war's brutality was by introducing a weapon which although used in the late stages of World War II and in Greece, was new to almost all observers in Korea. That was napalm. Here's a description from the New York Times. A napalm raid hit the village three or four days ago when the Chinese were holding up the advance and nowhere in the village 
have they buried the dead because there is no one left to bury them. The inhabitants throughout the village and in the fields were caught and killed and kept the exact postures that they held when the napalm struck. A man about to get on his bicycle, 50 boys and girls playing in an orphanage, a housewife strangely unmarked, holding in her hand a page torn from the Sears Roebuck catalog, crayoned at mail order number blah, blah, blah. Bewitching bed jacket coral. That's what she was going to buy. There must be almost 200 dead in this tiny hamlet, unquote. The United States may have also waged germ, germ warfare against North Korea and China, as will be discussed later. At the same time, the CIA reportedly was targeting a single individual for extermination. That was North Korean leader Kim Il-sung, because he had already made it perfectly clear to the CIA and the U.S. that he was not going to be their puppet. Washington sent a Cherokee Indian codenamed Buffalo to um, Hans Tofti, a CIA officer stationed in Japan, after Buffalo had agreed to serve as Kim Il-sung's assassin. Buffalo was to agree, uh, was to receive a considerable amount of money if he succeeded. It obviously did not, and nothing further was revealed about the incident. Another widely held belief in the U.S. during the war was that American prisoners in North Korean camps were dying off like flies because of the communist neglect and cruelty. The flames of this very emotional issue were fanned by the tendency of U.S. officials to exaggerate the number involved. During November 1951, for example, long before the end of the war, American military announcements put the count of POW deaths at 5,000 to 8,000. However, an extensive study completed by the U.S. Army two years after the war revealed that the POW death toll for the entire war was 2,700. Eh, 5,000, 8,000, 2,000, who's counting? Um, there were actually 7,000 held in camps with 7,190 and then 2,730 deaths. An unknown number of the prisoners, uh, let's see. The study concluded that there was evidence that a high death rate was not due primarily to mass maltreatment. It could be accounted for largely by the ignorance or callousness of the prisoners themselves. Callousness refers here to the soldier's lack of morale or collective spirit. Although not mentioned in the study, the North Koreans on several occasions claimed that many American POWs also died in the camps as a result of U.S. heavy bombing. The study, of course, could never begin to catch up with all of the scarce headlines to which the Western world had been treated for three consistent years. Obscured as well was the fact that several times as many communist prisoners had died in the South Korean camps halfway through the war, the official camp, halfway through the war, the official death toll was 6,600 of Northern Korean people dying in Southern Korean camps. The American public was also convinced and probably still is that North Korean and China had brainwashed US soldiers. This story arose to explain the fact that as many as 30% of American POWs had collaborated with the enemy in one way or the other and one man in seven or more than 13% was guilty of serious collaboration writing disloyal tracts or agreeing to spy or organize for the communists after the war. Gosh, I wonder why. Another reason the brainwashing theme was promoted in Washington was to increase the likelihood that statements made by returning prisoners, which questioned the official version of the war, would be discounted. Okay, so we're right at an hour, and this is a good place to stop. Um, I'm going to finish this uh, tomorrow, and um, I've only got not that much left. 
And um, we're going to then move on to a couple of other sources that um, basically go into a lot more detail of what actually happened in the South um, in some of these camps and some of these islands. Because what you're going to find, I'll just give you um, a cheat, um, is there were islands just like in Vietnam that was set up in Korea that were basically like torture camps. And, um, you know, how we established as part of Operation Gladio um, modus operandi is that they will take a island and they'll set up like a terrorist training camp and they will train people how to um, basically like a Schools of America kind of setup. They teach you how to torture, how to kidnap, how to assassinate people without leaving marks, blah, blah, blah. That was actually set up in South Korea on an island. And we're going to go over that. So that's what I've got um, for today. Um, we're going to go ahead and um, take, oh, there's Cousin It. Um, let me bring her up. Um, only the napalm history is just horrific. That's the only way I can, uh, you know, and, and of course, in the process of what you're reporting on and reading on, I'm bringing up a lot of historical articles. And, uh, you know, guys, retweet them, look at them, read them. It expands what we're already talking about. And uh, some of them, you know, you may want to pass over. You've got to leave. No. Because it really is horrific what Napalm does. And and they intentionally stockpiled it to use in Korea. Um, from what I've been reading, it looks like um, it was something we more or less figured out how to use, how to, and we refined our technique in Korea and Vietnam. That's a true statement. AMC, go ahead. I'm with Chad, Judith. It's important to think of Korea not as at the time it's not the North and South Korea because that wasn't really a thing by the post war and to have insult to injury in these in, in the battles of war is that the religious custom in the outer villages was to bury the dead and the elders on a hill almost in an upset position to overlook and protect the villages as well. So to add insult to injury, these burial grounds and stuff where they have done this sort of thing was not only uh, an attack on, on the living Koreans that were there, but also on their proposed eternity within their religious beliefs. So it was it was a twofold slapping face and it was almost reminiscent of the operations post-war with germany where germany got factioned in the north or east and west and once they break down the other faction into um western thinking then they want to tear down the wall and bring them together because now they're on our side it's it's unbelievable realize how repetitive the same tactics is. It, it's patterns and and that, thank you AMC for um, pointing that out because you're absolutely right. Um, and one of the articles um, that I read um, when we were gathering information on Korea talks about the um, cultural significance of the burial. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, and that is very true. This would be the, the heresy of mowing people down and um, it would be like, you know, spitting on someone's grave um, to just pile these people in um, like uh, dogs or cattle into an open grave and then bury them was culturally 
um, I mean, like of the highest sin um, that you could commit in the Korean culture. So absolutely. Jeff, go ahead. That's the same thing that they did to the pirates on the Barbary Coast by soaking the bullets and pig blood to kill the, the pirates at Tripoli. E. That was the same principle. Um, it just seems like I was meant to, the RICO statute. This to me, this to, to me seems like the largest case of RICO ever recorded in history from the start years before Korea, but all the way up through now, it seems like it's just a, the black syndicate. It's a huge RICO racket. It's terrible. Well, and what's interesting about this is because you can all, you can see that because of the kicking out of Japan across the entire country of Korea, what the West wanted to do was basically backfill Japan. They wanted to colonize Korea. They wanted to do it across the entire country. They wanted to own all of the infrastructure. They wanted to own all of the IT, um, like ITT, that company that owns the telephone companies. They wanted the railroads. They wanted all of that wealth. And um, if they had to pay off a few um, Koreans um, to have them as the fronts for their uh, companies, that's all fine and good. But they wanted the entire country. And they figured out that with the insistence of um, the Soviet Union not allowing the U.S. to have the entire country as a geographical region for um, the pushing out of Japan, that was kind of hit number one. So, okay, we'll, we'll share jurisdiction, but we're going to set up the South so that we can ultimately take over the North. But that was not without them trying to sweet talk the North and um, actually try to convince him, which we do have some material on that, um, to come along with them like they got re in the South. Um, but that didn't happen. And when that didn't happen, they settled temporarily um, to have that um, boundary more of a concrete thing than it was ever intended to. And then you can see the struggle in the South. So there was a internal civil war just in the South with the people who wanted their country back and the Stooges, the CIA and the U.S. Army uh, military slash, quote unquote, U.N. Um, regime that was setting up down there. Um, and you had the same thing that we saw in Colombia and Paraguay and Uruguay and Chile, where you have these forces that are patriots that want their country back. They've just lived decades under um, Japanese occupation. And so they start fighting with this new guy that left and ran away um, to reside in the United States, that the United States comes back and plops down in the South and pretend like he's in charge of everything. And so that fighting happens and um, they've got an internal war to an internal civil war. Um, and that's what was going on the entire time. And any of the it's it's like the perfect scenario if you're an asshole bad guy because you can kill all the people in the south that's going to um stop you from doing what you ultimately are going to do anyway while killing the people in the north and fighting them and trying to take their land and if that doesn't work out oh well we'll go back to the 39th parallel but meanwhile i've gotten rid of all the resistance and i blamed getting rid of them on the north it's like the perfect scenario bastards anyway i noticed you had kind of chuckled when you were talking about vietnam and the, all the you call that uh, propaganda coming out of vietnam and you were chuckling that was that was that was quite telling yeah i mean it you have to laugh is so horrifying that any of this happened um if you didn't laugh you'd cry stellar i'm interested in hearing your thoughts My thing wasn't undoing. 
I was kind of blown away by this stuff. Like everything that I thought that was happening in Korea, you know, like the history that I was familiar with, and my mom's going to be blown away. It's totally all lies. I mean, and like he was talking about like the burials and stuff. There's a lot of stuff that had happened, um, and it still goes on with things that are disrespectful to Koreans. And the fact that, they, you know, a lot of the trees were taken down, that, that was like a huge big thing with them. I have no idea how, how, I have no idea that the Koreans or this stuff was this bad. For, I, I had no idea. I don't think any of us did, Stella. We've been lied to our whole lives. But you can understand what motivated me once I started doing this research to bring it to everybody um, so that we can stop it. Go ahead. Go ahead, Cousin It. So it, this is definitely current event news. Um, Korea, North Korea and South Korea are having their own little, uh, I call it the balloon wars. I don't know if anybody's familiar, but uh, apparently South Korea thought it would be really neat to fly balloons over North Korea and dump propaganda leaflets, um, you know, just like back in the old days. And North Korea has responded by flying balloons over South Korea filled with shit and garbage. Yep, and dumping so, it. <laughs> yep, and dumping them off. So I have to laugh because it's such a passive aggressive thing to do and funny as hell. But um, yeah, that's their response to the propaganda from South Korea, but they're doing it again. So there you go. Yeah, old habits are hard to break. Um, I was also going to say another thing that I found unique is like when I've been over at my mom's and stuff, like she'll be watching YouTube, Korean news and stuff like that. Their news talks a lot about, I guess, she says they, because they can't talk about China, so they show North Korea, which I think is hilarious because on the West, we don't see much, you know, North Korean footage and stuff. And in, you know, on their Korean stuff or whatever she found that she listens to, um, they'll show a lot of footage in Korea, uh, Northern Korea and stuff like that, like with the floodings or stuff like that. So it'd be like, oh, it's happening in China, but they can't say it's in China. So they say it's North Korea. So I find that to be kind of interesting as well. That is very interesting. You know, actually, Stellar, I'm going to jump in on that. There actually is a lot of flooding going on in North Korea. Um, Kim was um, in a boat and surveying the damage. So yeah, there actually is flooding going on there. Um, oh, oh yeah, well, I'm all really I'm flooding in China as well, so. Yeah, I guess when, when they talk in Korean and stuff like that, that's what she was saying. She's like, they're showing the, the flooding in North Korea. She goes, but um, China's way, way worse. They can't broadcast that, but she gets, I guess she's finding out a lot of stuff that's over there, but again, any of this stuff have no idea how that it was a CIA playground. Everything apparently is their playground. Um, and I did, speaking of that, I did want to, um, um, for those of you, um, uh, one of you, uh, Bridget or Cousin Ed, if you wouldn't mind taking a screenshot um, of or get a map up because um, we would normally start with that. Um, and I want you to understand um, where this is and why it's so important. Because when you look at um, the Korean, Korean Peninsula, um, and keep in mind what was going on over there at the time, you have... Um, uh, Tokyo, you have Japan, okay? And we're occupying Japan at the time, right? This post-World War II, MacArthur's there for like five years. Um, and Korea is literally right across the water. I mean, like take a boat, sail right over to South Korea um, or to Korea in general, which is why... Um, Japan wanted it as a colony. They used Korea as a jumping off point to get into China. And uh, Japan was all in China. Um, they were in Northern China. They were in Southern China. They were all over China um, in during World War II. 
okay, in the lead up to World War II. So if you look at Korea from a strategic standpoint, you also have to look at where Taiwan is. And if you look at where Taiwan is in, and keep in mind, the, U, the, the CIA had decided to set up Taiwan as their massive base of drug operations. And you've got um, Hong Kong, which is their money laundering place. You've got Shanghai, which was basically an international city, um, primarily led by the, the Brits. Um, and you have um, Bangkok around, the, keep going down. You've got Vietnam, you've got Bangkok, you've got Laos, Cambodia. So this is the southern part of China. You've got um, Vietnam, Laos, Burma, which is now Miramar. That's the major opium growing um, uh, bread basket of the world, right? And just outside of that, you've got the Philippines, you've got Japan, blah, blah, blah. So this is huge. Um, having your forces over there and military operations going on, as you are setting up your opium growing, in that region, which is exactly what was happening. Because remember, Paul Helliwell was basically the U.S. aide to um, Chiang Kai-shek, going all over South China with him and watching him fund his war against Mao with opium profits. And they took that model and basically extrapolated that model all over the world. So the kingpin of that model was Chiang Kai-shek. And he wanders around in South China for a little bit, gets kicked out of there, finally goes to Burma, and then eventually goes to um, Taiwan and gets set up there by the CIA to orchestrate um, the opium um, from that area. So all of that is very important when you look at what is going on and why Korea was so important. Bridget, go ahead. Oh, uh, I don't know what I'll have to rethink. Okay, cousin it, go ahead. Well, one of the borders that they have is Russia as well. Um, if you, if y'all look at a map, they do border Russia, and that's important to know because um, Kim and Putin have been in talks with each other, and essentially North Korea is healing the wounds um, that they've had with China. I don't know if they'll ever get over Japan, um, but they are, I think Putin is actively working to try to build a bridge, literally and figuratively, um, into Russia from North Korea um, and build a bridge figuratively with China um, to repair um, that animosity between the countries. Um, and that actually is important because 90% of what's going on with those countries are a, as a direct result of our interference. Um, you know, eventually, I mean, there were, yes, did they have their own squabbles and spats and border fights and whatever? Yes, of course they did. But, you know, that was, the, we stoked those fires um, in order to get the direct trade going in that area um, and to create enemies and to loot these countries. Um, Japan stole 90% of the jade um, coming out of Korea. And for those of you that don't know, jade is um, a very valuable commodity in Korea. Um, they have a very distinct um, type of jade. I think we lost her. Um, okay. Let me bring her back up. I don't know what happened. She's connecting, Colonel. Yeah. Korean jade is very valuable. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm bringing her back up. Yeah, if you look, if you... Huh? Yeah. And also, let's remember the Emerald Triangles were Michelin, the French colony. They colonized rubber is 75% of the reserve is there, I believe. Right, Colonel? Oh, I don't know the exact number. Um, where number one tar company in the world used to be Michelin. That's why they're there. Where Where did she go? I invited her uh, back to speak. Yeah, I think she dropped completely in. What the hell? Uh, yeah. All right, AMC, go ahead. AMC, did you have a comment or a I'm question? Sorry. No, I was just going to say, all right, so when I was in the Army, I was stationed in Korea the entire year, pretty much 97. Um, it was September 96, September 97. So I was curious about the flights because the flight narrative but i mean they had a crazy monsoon season and it flooded during the monsoon so they actually have like two level bridges because the bottom level will flood um and they don't really build their infrastructure properly out of flood zones um so on that note but the, the other note that i wanted to bring up was that even back in 97 when i was there when i was stationed there my introduction to Korea after landing there and getting bused to the in processing base and so on. Uh, we literally, everybody started running the other side, you know, moving out of the seat to the side of the bus, crushing me almost against the other side window because college demonstrators were throwing Mautau candles at the bus because they knew it was a military bus. So I'm kind of curious to know is the same. Uh, college rebellion demonstrations, riots happening now that were happening, you know, a decade and a half ago. And, or did they like infiltrate the narrative against the, the rebellion of the, the college students that were actually learning the history and what went on? Well, my best friend, well, one of my best friends um, just got back from Korea. She spent the, a month over there and she went um, all over uh, Korea, um, both in bus trains um, and she didn't see any um, like turmoil. Uh, and, and she said, you know, obviously compared to what's going on in Europe right now and her and her husband are on their way in October that he has an assignment to Germany. Um, and, um, so I'm like, you better hold on to everything. Um, but she was remarkably impressed with, um, Korea, um, and her ability to move around there and how orderly and clean and well-behaved everybody was. Wow. Because that whole year I was there, even when we had demonstrations everywhere, every weekend. And we'd have to actually reroute our convoy routes to go to the field or anything like that to get her to, to repass around. No demonstration, right? At least. Yeah, I've obviously had several of my friends um, stationed there as well. And that was kind of their takeaway, too. But what I have noticed is um, something else, um, which happens in Okinawa, too, is there is a lot of resentment specifically towards the U.S. and them not wanting us there. Um, so it, it would be interesting to, you know, obviously being in the military, you primarily are in uh, areas that are frequented by the military and a lot, you see a lot of those riots. The same is true in Okinawa. Um, but like my girlfriend going over there um, with her daughter for 30 days, going all over the um, South Korea. She's not staying in any place that is specifically um, U.S. Mil military, you know, presence and was treated completely fine. Um, so it's very interesting. One, one more follow up. Because the sentiment of the U.S. military, my comrade, when I was there, I mean, we all thought that. U.S. and South Korea were going to be at war with North Korea, but and remind me, this is like 2000, late 2007, going into 2008, and our our sentiment was by 2005, U.S. and South Korea are going to be at war with North Korea. 
little did we know what was developing in the Saudi region. <laughs> and so I kind of think like all of them side interests kind of put that on the burner. Well, if you, we would have been but probably. If you don't, if if you, if you're, I, I assume you're new here. What the the whole underpinning of this movement is called a strategy of tension. They have to do this in order to steal our wealth and put it in the military industrial complex. They have to keep that fear mongering up all the time because otherwise we would be in the streets protesting our money going towards a military that we absolutely do not need. So they have to orchestrate a need in order to get us to begrudgingly give our support to their basically um, taking over in our name all of these different countries. Right. It's in our name, but it's also a globalized oligarchy. Oh, absolutely. We call it the International Syndicate. Yeah, it's a criminal syndicate. Cousin It, are you back? I don't see your um, microphone muted, so I'm not sure you're actually back. She probably can't unmute her microphone. That's what happens to me at times. Yeah, she was. And then I think it must have kicked her back out. If you can try and drop her up or down. All right. Okay. Uh all right, I'm going to remove her as a co-host again and see if we can't just get her back as a speaker. I don't know what the heck's going on. One of the things that I've noticed, though, like with my mom's friends, my mom's in her 80s. She's, you know, late 80s and her friends are as old as she is. But even like their kids that are my age and their kids that are, you know, way younger <laughs> um they all seem to want the unified korea back together again um which i don't think america wants them to be unified but i know that the, a lot of the koreans that i know they seem to want to have it unified well that would make perfect sense doesn't it i mean it it goes against nature to have it to have the conflict in my opinion right so <laughs> Yeah, I can't, I can't off the table either because currently, if you look at um, the past few decades of Japan and the zero interest lending on reverse carry trade in the U.S. markets and the globalized oligarch control money funding launder through the U.S. market, and now that reverse carry trade being uh, U.S. bond liquidated by Japan as a financial basic attack against U.S dollar to try to close the spread gap against the inflationary yen. Um, it's almost like Japan did the free lending for so long to build that financial exposure to just try to undermine the money circle. Well, you, there's a lot of flexibility when someone else is um, taking care of all your military needs. Cousin It, um, are you back for real? Oh, I have no idea. I'm okay. You're back. Yeah, oh, yeah. Yay. No, you know what? I, that was the weirdest thing. All right. All of a sudden, it was just gone, and then the space didn't even show up in my feed. And then when it did show up in my feed, and I wanted to go get back in, I sent you a screenshot. There was nobody there. Hey, that's happened to me, and it's my own space. So, <laughs> yeah, I got the white screen. <laughs> yeah, screen is there. The white screen. But um, one of the things I don't know, I posted it on the billboard there. Um, so real quick before I get do it again. Um, North Korea is actually sitting on like ten trillion dollars mm -hmm. worth of assets and stocks. Um, and that's real important to keep in mind when Putin went down to shake the man's hand and build a bridge from North Korea into Russia. Um, they're sitting, they're, the problem is, is that we sanction North Korea so badly that they can't even afford to extract their own minerals and their own um, assets. 
there. Um, and Russia is going to help them. And probably China as well. It's in China's benefit. Um, you know, North Korea has lithium mines. So there you go. Um, you know, at, at this point, our, our United States is going to be like the third world country. And I, you know, China coming in and buying up all of our land here. One of the things that they did do, um, all that farmland in North Dakota and that area is actually st sitting on the Balkan formation. And if nobody's familiar with that, um, that's actually one of the largest oil reserves in the United States. And China's bought all the land sitting on top of it. So there you go. Um, but now North Korea is working with Russia and China. So we'll see what happens to our United States under this communist dictatorship. Um, and there's China, a lot to do. And China's been helping North Korea out for decades now. Um, they've been helping oh. North Korea out for decades and decades. So, I mean, of course, um, China and North Korea are going to be very, very happy once they get that, you know, the minerals and things out from underground. Yeah. I mean, $10 trillion is stuff. That's a good chunk of change. So, so, so I want to point out something um, that... <laughs> has to be said every once in a while as as a reminder. Um, one of the things, obviously, that um, that's part of this whole thing is the identification of the international syndicate and their theft of all of the resources. I mean, that's the motivating factor behind Operation Gladio to begin with. And <laughs> what's interesting, um, and many people point this out, and Tucker probably did it the most notoriously as far as looking at the landmass of Russia and all of these idiots that um, keep mouthing, oh, Russia is going to come into Europe. What the fuck does, Russia, does Europe have that Russia wants? Nothing. If Russia was the aggressor that everyone says that they are, would they not be in Africa taking over all those countries? Would they not be in North Korea taking over that country? They certainly could militarily. Europe doesn't have shit. That's the reason why Europe took over Africa. They don't have crap. Nobody wants them. They're a hellhole. So as far as resources go. So I find it hysterical that they can perpetrate this the most ridiculous garbage narrative and everybody's goes like my aunt Hazel, my dad's sister used to have that dog that sat on her um, dashboard in her car, that little bobbling head dog that every time we went on, over a bump, the head nodded. And that's what people are these days. They don't even use their freaking brain. Russia does not want Europe. Europe doesn't have anything, but a bunch of, shitty uh, protesters right now and they don't have resources. There's lots of places that have resources. Um, Europe's not one of them. Go ahead, Stellar. I was going to say um, over the last five or six years, Russia's been helping some of these developing countries as well as China um, with their monetary system. And a lot of them are going into bricks. So there's a lot of, like you said, the West or America, you know, even though we're the reserve currency at this point, which is being propped up, we're going to see a whole lot of hurt. And, um, you know, um, yeah, because there's just, but okay. So, you know how you're talking about the land that's been like purchased up. I know that they did that in Texas to CCP and stuff. And they did that here in Vegas. I have a feeling that if they have to do with like, you know, those executive orders that Trump has, you know, you know, so say the CCP will go with them. You know, we know that they're involved with human trafficking and all kinds of nefarious things, too. I guess I'm just kind of thinking, you know, even though they have all these different reserves, say, in, in the United States and different places and stuff like that, Texas, they're right along the border. There's like all kinds of land that they're buying up through there. Um, I guess I'm kind of thinking that, you know, we'll get that back with the executive orders. <laughs> Or am I just dreaming? <laughs> no, I mean, the executive orders could certainly do that if they're found guilty of the types of things that are in those executive orders. So um, I 
I too feel like there's something else going on there. Um, and of course, we've pointed out the irony of um, uh, us protesting the um, purchase of our farmland by a foreigner when we've um, fought 10 and 15 year um, wars, guerrilla wars in um, Latin America because American companies had bought up all of their farmland and wouldn't give it back. And if a president tried to take the land back, even if they paid for it, they were murdered. So um, yeah, the irony there is just like crazy over the top. And who knows, but what that's not to point out that irony um, that you, we have done that all over the world. And when it's done to us, we get butt hurt about it. Well, in the 1800s, a lot of the, you know, a lot of what the European influence was here too, is because I guess our constitution made it so that they couldn't literally own the land, like have, t have title to the land. So they did stuff also within the constitution, but that's where the different founding, fa those other families came into play when it came to like the um, land trust, like the railroads and the other types of different things too, which also was wrapped up but when Bush, Bush, Daddy Bush was in and stuff. So there's a lot of shady shit going on. A lot of shady shit. AMC, what you got? I'm going back to your Japan, North Korea, bricks, the oil coming off the oil dollar. It's important to remember that Japan doesn't have its own energy resources for supplying its energy needs. It imports it on. So there's that. Yeah, Japan doesn't have, Japan's like Europe. Um, they don't have a lot of natural resources, which of course is what supposedly drove their um, pre-World War II conquest of basically almost the entire Pacific was stealing everybody's resources. So you had a lot of that shit going on. And interestingly enough, the, the one that was doing it in the Pacific, Japan, ends up on one side and the one that was doing it in like Africa and um, other places um, ended up in the allies uh, camp, you know, in Europe. And so I, I find that um, very interesting. The um, it seems like they're all in on something and um, orchestrate wars when in fact there's very little difference between either side from that perspective. So anyway, all right. So that's our first day of Korea. Like I said, we're gonna cover um, a whole bunch of other. Um, Carrie, go ahead. Hi, I just, um, I have a question, but I just wanted to say um, that Japan has absolutely no independence, whatever they did with their uh, interest rate um, was what they were told to do. That's my idea. Um, and I wonder if you ever spent any time in Okinawa. I know a little bit about um, how horrible it is there for the people. I just wondered if you ever experienced it. No. Thank I you. I've had several friends there and my ex-husband was there. Um, so I'm, I'm very familiar with it. Um, but I physically have never been there. Cousin it. Um, yes. I just want to remind everybody tonight that following Elon and Trump's discussion here, I imagine it's going to be here and on rumble. Yes. Their discussion is on spaces. Oh, so not on Rumble either, just here. Okay. Well, I'm sure it'll be um, streamed over there on, by some people, but the actual um, encounter will be on spaces. Okay. Um, well, I guess we'll have to keep an eye open for that because there's a lot of our followers that are following exclusively on Rumble because they don't have any X accounts. Yeah, I'm sure somebody will live stream it over there. Um, right. Um, so afterwards, everybody, Froggy is going to have a space, um, not, a, not a Gladio space, um, just a post-game post discussion, um, which I hope everybody is going to come join us over. 
um, and show some support. I know that he's got a few choice words for a couple of people out there and <laughs> in <laughs> Twatterland. <laughs> Yeah, we mentioned that at the beginning. Thanks for the reminder. Um, yeah. Definitely, um, the the matchup with Elon and President Trump is going to be um, historic. Um, and I I did want to um, make sure you guys saw the one um, uh, post that I made when um, that's there's the letter that EU. Um, put in scolding Elon for having oh. Trump on, and uh, I, I hold on a second. Hysterical. Yeah, I I want to make sure everybody understands that's much bigger than what most people are um, making it out to be because our military and our civil service that are stationed overseas have to go through those censorship um, internet protocols in order to get their information. So there is not an independent way um, because the connections that they have on base are not allowed to have political, you know, like their normal uh, read file information, their emails, like from a works perspective, you can't just pull up uh, social media on there. And so their only way of doing it is through those local internet providers in country. And so if that information is being censored, um, they literally have no way um, if they throttled the internet for our military uh, men and women to get unbiased, open and free information to be able to vote in an election. And so that's very, very disturbing. All the more reason to get a VPN, people. That's yeah. one of the perfect reasons to get a VPN. You know, if anybody overseas is listening right now, well, I'm wondering what the, the deal is, because technically in some of those uh, Internet protocol laws that those uh, that they have enacted, if you actually even have it on your um, computer and stuff like that and you're living off base, um, I don't know what the um, ramifications for our military people are. Um, it's It's quite disturbing. And who the hell would have thought we'd ever have that conversation? Stellar, go ahead. Thing is Gladio. <laughs> when you guys said hey, man, having the, um, he wasn't going to have that Gladio space tonight, I'm like, but everything is glad <laughs> coming to find out. <laughs> yeah, right. Good point. Good point. Touche. All right, guys. Froggy. 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 What's up? Yeah. What happened? <laughs> Tell everybody what your discussion is going to be tonight. Well, first of all, some of these patriots that sell raffle tickets to give away cars, which no one probably got a car, they pretend like they're big MAGA supporters, but never post about being active, being local. You know, they see them at a rally, but never seen them at the GOP, the RNC. We're going to talk about, we're going to talk about Q drops. All of a sudden, all these people are starting in here, coming and saying that Q is a LARP and people need to wake up. It, and I saw Colonel Towner's post is the first one that I saw. You know, not like those guys, but they're just entertainers. But they don't know dick about anything going on whatsoever. So they don't talk I about anything watching. going on. I I love love watching. Watching. Yeah, we do. <laughs> well, no, I mean, I'm, I'm serious. You're going to see a lot more of these people that are fake MAGA people reveal themselves. What's the I point know. in post? What's the point in posting the bullshit he posted? Right? Honestly, right. there is no That's point funny. whatsoever. So it's going to be it's going to be just a space for diggers, researchers, and nuns to get together and talk about what's going on and celebrate Q plus being back on X. <laughs> well, I'll bring my coffee, and it sounds like a shot of bourbon. <laughs> it's going to be fun after him and Elon talk. It's going to be explosive. You see all the big Q accounts getting their getting their uh, handles back. Yeah, I saw Sun Tzu got his back today. Yeah. Oh, no. Oh. It's, it's coming. All the researchers, all the people telling the truth. You know, you don't have to be a Q person to be in a non. You're people that dig for information, right? I care about child trafficking. I care about what's going on with the bankers globally and corrupt governments, right? 
but I, I did, you know, follow that stuff and, you know, learn to discern for myself. Right. And I can tell you, there's so many people out here now that are awake because of that movement. And it's the people that just care about how many clicks and likes and followers. They don't ever retweet or follow anybody else. They just circle jerk each other that, you know, which I don't even care. I'm never even really on here unless something happens. I just had to make that really clear that, you know, it's time to clean out the closet because people like that aren't doing it. I mean, I guess he, he did bring people up at some point, but when he says the election, that Q is the reason people are complacent, there are more people actively involved. I've been to the RNC. I've been to the GOP meetings here in Nevada. I mean, those people are Q people. I mean, it's amazing to me. And they're just, they're just old people out there that are concerned about the truth and found out the truth on Twitter. So anyway, that's what the space is going to be for. Just going to be a big part of a celebration. And, you know, awesome. don't even name any names. I look forward to it. It should be a lot of fun. It was spur of the moment based off all that bullshit that was happening. All righty. All right. right. I guess I'm going to go have something to eat before uh, <laughs> the big event. And hopefully your spaces will be operating correctly. What are they? Because it certainly didn't for me today. <laughs> you, you don't have a proof speech, though. All right. Well, no, I don't think they want me to talk there. All right. Tonight, everyone, please watch that Trump Elon thing tonight. I think there'll be some exposure. Absolutely. And then tune in to the pawn afterwards. Yeah, that'd be great. Anyone, anyone's welcome. If you want to learn some stuff and you want some proofs, it'd be fun to, fun to listen. All right. See you guys tomorrow, 4 o'clock. Thanks for being here. Yeah, thank you, Colonel. Much love to you and your team. You too.